Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the seven deadly sins of concurrent programming. Thank you for choosing our talk for this morning. We're very happy to be here. I'm Sarah. I'm a software developer at Murex. I've been coding for more than 10 years. And uh, I'm Taufik. Uh, I've been in Murex five years now, uh, most, mostly worked with uh, Sarah. Uh, just a few words about uh, Murex. So Murex is a leader in fintech, fintech uh, software for capital markets. Uh, we are around uh, more than 2,000 people, mostly based uh, in Paris, but we are scattered a little bit uh, around the world. And uh, our software is uh, used uh, all around the world. There are around 50,000 people, 50, people uh, rely on it uh, every day. So why this talk? Why are we here today? Along with Taufik and others of our colleagues at Murex, we have worked for several years on overhauling the real-time portfolio management solution at Murex. Now, don't worry, you don't need to understand what that is for this talk. What you do need to understand is it's more than 100,000 lines of highly concurrent Java code, distributed and deployed over hundreds of services, and hosting thousands of threads. So we took that project from the lab all the way to production. And along with that experience, we learned a lot, of mis a lot of lessons, mostly from mistakes that we've seen in the code, sometimes mistakes that we made ourselves and learned from. So the good news is that with each mistake comes a best practice that imposes itself. And when we applied those best practices, we reaped very tangible benefits in terms of the stability of our code and in terms of the productivity of our team. So this is what we would like to share with you today in this uh, presentation in the hope that it will be a little bit useful to you in your uh, respective fields. So you might be wondering, why concurrency? So with all that code and all that scale, surely there have been a lot of mistakes all over the place. And that is a very fair question. All code is error-prone, even non-concurrent code. But let me ask you a question. How many of you remember your very first deadlock? Maybe a little show of hands. How about your first race condition? Yes? It's quite a, uh, an experience that you don't really forget. Uh, no, I don't mean the first time that you read about it in a book or a blog or someone explained it to you. I mean the first time that you personally wrote a piece of code which looked perfectly innocent and correct to you. Only when executed concurrently, it took on a mind of its own and it did something completely unexpected. Now, I don't know about you, I don't remember the technical details of my first deadlock, it's been many years, and I definitely don't remember the technical details of every single race condition that I've written in my career. What I do remember very vividly, though, is how it felt. And it's not really the best feeling in the world, is it? It's a little bit overwhelming. And essentially what happens is that a piece of code that you wrote, that you thought you mastered and had control over, outsmarted you. So what just happened? What happens there? And I got to wondering when preparing for this talk, is this just me? Is it just the developers that I've happened to work with? Or is there a more common problem related to, to concurrency? And it turns out that neuroscience might have some answers for us. An MIT professor of neuroscience has written in one of his research papers, as humans, we have very limited capacity for simultaneous thought. He also goes on to explain how bad we are at multitasking, but we all know that, right? So uh, what can we conclude from this? Uh, when you think about it, computers are actually very good at simultaneous execution. That's what they're designed for, particularly the more recent ones. So there is quite an important gap between the capacity of the computer to execute simultaneous stuff and our capacity as humans to even think about it. And that might explain part of the reasons why concurrency is quite complicated for us to handle. But this is not all bad news, and it doesn't mean that we should just stop doing concurrency. With this new knowledge comes new understanding, which will help us design our systems in such a way to set ourselves up for success rather than setting ourselves up for failures and race conditions and deadlocks. So in this talk, we're going to be doing a coding exercise, so Fika and I are going to be doing this exercise based on code snippets in the slides. We're going to go from a business requirement all the way to a prototype implementation. Uh, the business requirement is loosely based on finance, just to make it a little bit more interesting. We're going to be doing seven iterations. In each iteration, we are going to be exposing 
some deadly sins or pitfalls or mistakes in concurrency, things that we have seen. So very pragmatic, very hands-on. And we're going to be proposing best practices uh, in order to deal with those pitfalls or avoid them altogether. Now, in order to perform this exercise, we're going to be playing roles. There are three roles. I'm going to be playing two roles. My first role is a product manager. So, <laughs> how many of you work with product managers on a daily basis, or product owners, or business owners, depending on the size of your uh, organization? So you pretty much know what it is. In two words, it's the person who's responsible for bringing in the business case, uh, explaining the business use cases, and making sure that we deliver real value to clients. Now, my second role is going to be the role of a junior developer. So in this role, my responsibility is going to be to try to understand the business requirement and translate it into a technical solution. I'm a junior developer, though, here, so I have very limited experience and almost no experience at concurrency at all. So I'm going to be struggling, and I'm going to need some help. And this is where the third role comes in, which is Taufik's role. And this is the role of the veteran developer. And he's going to be okay. helping me uh, in order to uh, find and pinpoint potential pitfalls in the code that I've written and guide me towards a better solution. So, ready? Yes. Let's get started. The business requirement. So, as a product manager, I, uh, I'm a product manager of a trading system at a company called Super Trading Inc. Our uh, system allows traders to book trades and it computes financial results. It also computes something called profit. Now, don't worry, you don't need to understand the financial details of all of that. Just imagine it as a sort of a transaction that's going on, a buy-sell thing. And uh, there are some important financial results that need to be calculated to allow the trader to make decisions. Uh, and profit is basically what it says. It's telling the trader, are you losing money today or are you gaining money? All right. Uh, an important thing to keep in mind is that the financial results are at the level of the trade for the purpose of this exercise. The profit is more global. So I want to know all in all, am I positive, am I negative, am I doing well or not? OK? okay. Yes. Now, um, our system is currently being used by one trader at a bank, and they are extremely happy with it. So the bank has decided to extend the activity to the entire trading floor. This means hundreds of traders. So we are extremely excited about this. It's a great business opportunity, and we're very eager to get that into production. Okay. As I explained, I am also a junior developer. I'm an aspiring developer, let's say. And uh, so I'll be also explaining to you the architecture now, and I'll explain to you a little bit also the code that we have today. So architecture is very simple. We have a client, we have a server. The request goes from the client to the server. The request in our case is going to be triggered when a trader books a trade. That request is blocking and synchronous. So when it receives, uh, the server receives this request, it's going to perform all those calculations that I told you about, the financial results, the profit, and all that, and then return a response to the client. Fair enough? Yes. Let's take a quick, load, a quick look at the code. So you have a trading service. The main method and the main entry point to our service is the compute trade <coughs> method, which takes a trade ID and returns a result. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to do a trade computation. It's going to delegate that to a financial engine that knows how to do those calculations. And that's going to produce a trade result. Then we're going to take that trade result and cache it in a map. Then we're going to compute the profit that I told you about, <clears throat> which is an operation that requires going through all the trade results and computing this global profit thing. Okay? Once that is done, we're going to encapsulate the results that we have, the trade result and the profit, put them in one object, and send them back to the client. And all that is blocking and synchronous. So this is working very well for us <coughs> today, but with our future solution, with our future need, the architecture is going to evolve to something more like this. So we're going to have the server still, only instead of one client, we're going to have n clients. And they're all going to be sending requests simultaneously to the server and we are expected to be able to respond to all these requests simultaneously. So I've given this some thought, and um, I have a preliminary solution that I would like to share with you to, to have your opinion. 
Okay. So the first thing that I thought is what parts of that compute method can happen in parallel safely and what parts are not thread safe. So I looked at the code and the first line, the one where I call the trade computation engine, is perfectly thread safe. Why? Because each trade is completely independent of the other. So if I calculate them in parallel, that's perfectly fine. However, the rest of my method is not thread safe at all because what it's doing is that it's um, putting the results in a map and then reading those results from a map, iterating over the map, doing a calculation, and then encapsulating and, and returning a result, which means that I have potential concurrent read-write access on that code if it happens in parallel. So I need to protect it. So what I propose is to add a synchronization over that uh, part of the code, what I call the critical section in the code. So okay. what do you think? Well, uh, first I see that uh, you did the synchronized in the same compute uh, method, uh, compute trade method. And uh, if I understand well how the service works, this uh, compute trade is actually being called uh, by the same thread that uh, is responsible for, for uh, processing all requests that are coming. So, for example, in a container or whatever uh, tool, maybe an in-house uh, solution that you use to uh, process uh, requests and uh, call the correct method. If, uh, for some reason, because I saw that uh, the compute method is, uh, can be lengthy, can take uh, some time, if uh, one thread is being uh, too greedy and holding that uh, shared resource or that lock uh, for too long, uh, what can happen is that you actually uh, cause uh, a thread starvation in uh, your, your service. So actually you end up uh, blocking, uh, if uh, there's too many requests on the, that compute thread method, all those threads will become blocked. And actually this, is, this, can, be, this can go beyond uh, this because uh, on uh, real life, uh, one service does not have only one endpoint, usually it has uh, several ones, and uh, even those uh, ones, won't, uh, you won't be able to process them. So actually this, this, uh, this has a kind of a ripple effect where suddenly your whole service is unresponsive. And uh, it can go even worse if uh, you have a, a service-oriented architecture or a microservice architecture. Uh, you have services calling other services, calling other services. And uh, if uh, this is the way, uh, you, if you repeat this mistake on uh, all the other services, well, you end up blocking uh, uh, other services as well. And your whole system uh, is, uh, is blocked. Hmm. So just so I understand, uh, in this diagram, those round things are the threads yes. that, that are coming into the system, yeah, and exactly. that shared resource is the lock exactly. that I'm locking on. And what you're saying is that I might reach a point where my service cannot handle any more threads because I'm blocking all those threads, uh, potentially for extended periods of time. Yes. Okay, that, that sounds fair enough, and I definitely don't want to do that. So. Uh, what I can propose is that I will create a runnable, so when I receive my request, instead of treating it right away on that same thread that's calling me, I'm going to create a runnable and put all my business logic in there, all the calculation logic, and then I'm going to create a thread, I'm going to start that new thread, put that runnable on there, and then return the control to the caller. However, uh, by doing that, uh, I no longer can return the result right away on the compute trade method since it's no longer blocking and synchronous. So I also had to add a send computation result notification in order to let my trader know when the result is done. Okay. Well, it looks like uh, our first problem uh, is solved. But here, I think, uh, first of all, there's a small uh, bug here. Uh, I don't know if you notice it, but... Uh, we synchronize uh, on the same disk. This uh, basically happens if you do a copy-paste, which we do all the time. And uh, especially if you copy-paste uh, code which is, has uh, logs and synchronization inside it, you can have this, this kind of uh, uh, tricky uh, box. In this case, actually, the disk is pointing on the runnable, and actually, we lost uh, our trade safety. So we need to correct this first. Ouch. OK, yeah. let's, let's just pretend that never happened and put in a proper lock in there. Okay, so now we have our trade safety back. Uh, so if I understand well, for every compute trade request that you get, you are starting a thread by yourself, uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, costly actually. 
and uh, you let it process the request and uh, you return com uh, immediately and uh, so you, you are able to process other requests. But here uh, you are putting yourself actually at risk because what you can risk is that you crash all your application because uh, if you create too many threads, uh, your application will eventually uh, crash. Uh, actually, there was a talk uh, Wednesday afternoon, I think, by Dr. Heinz uh, about threads in this same room. And uh, on his laptop, he could uh, crash his uh, application for around uh, 8,000 threads. And uh, what you get is an out of memory exception, which looks uh, out of memory error, uh, rather, which was like this, where basically you are, you are, you are not able to create any more threads. So I think the, the, the lesson here is that we should, we should always control uh, the resources that uh, you are creating mm. and not let it be uh, uh, at risk from uh, uh, crazy users. So for sooner or later, you will have uh, too many requests and uh, your application might crash. Mm. I see, so if I rephrase that, what you're saying is that even though I'm within a JVM, Actually, the JVM does not completely shield me from native uh, resources that I request, and I need to be careful about those resources and be a, basically a good citizen on the machine that I'm on and not abuse those resources. That makes sense, and I think I can fix that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a constant number of threads. Now, I've done some research, and the machine that my client is using has 28 cores. So I'm going to go for 20 threads as a default value, but I'm going to make that configurable so that I can bench it in production and be able to, to change it to suit the, the needs. OK, so, so applying the test and don't uh, guess uh, a rule, actually. Sure, yeah. Yeah. if you say so. And uh, so I'm going to create an executor service. I'm going to pick a fixed thread pool executor service because that seems to be the one that uh, sort of, you know, doesn't uh, bypass the number of threads that I give it. And the rest is just uh, rather than uh, giving my runnable to the th new thread that I was creating, I will just send my runnable off to the executor service. And that should fix the problem for me, right? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I see that you use the, the fixed thread pool, which is, uh, I think, which is a good choice. But uh, is it the executor's uh, library gives uh, a lot of nice methods to create uh, several types of uh, thread pools. Uh, one of them is cache thread pool, which is actually a thread pool with does, which does not have a, a limit on number of threads you can create, even though the cache thread pool actually uh, 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 cleans the threads after one minute once uh, they, they've done their job. But if you have issue that uh, the same had before, where one thread is blocking on the same lock, then uh, even if uh, you, you will end up with the same issue, actually. So that's a good choice. Uh, then I see that we still have our synchronization here uh, on the service, uh, which is uh, too bad because uh, here, uh, if uh, we, we if we have uh, the same issue, we will uh, be blocking all the threads inside our executor service. The requests on the queue of the exec executor service will uh, will be queued, uh, but you will end up with the uh, actually the same issue. But at least you are uh, blocking it, uh, you are containing it. So here, I think uh, our, our our synchronization is uh, one one thing, one. Uh, way we can solve this is uh, to break our uh, synchronization. Well, basically, we should hold the lock uh, a little less, uh, not uh, too, for too long. Uh, one way to do it is just uh, to break the lock, maybe hold it on a uh, 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 smaller scope, actually. Uh, that way, you don't, you don't just synchronize uh, blindly using uh, like the synchronized uh, word uh, on every method, which we tend to do as developers. <laughs> You put the synchronized everywhere, and you hope uh, it will work uh, correctly. But in this case, since we are trying to have a uh, uh, service which, uh, with the high throughput, we need to be more careful about the, the scope of the lock. So I'm, I'm wondering if, the, if this lock actually makes sense, because uh, we are computing uh, trades. Uh, does it make sense that for all trades, we need to, to lock uh, on uh, the same lock? Um, so. Let, let me just try to see if I got my, my head around this correctly. So what you're saying here is um, because all of my threads, my 20 threads, 
are taking the same lock, actually I might think that I'm doing things in parallel, but I'm not, because yes. they're all kind of waiting for each other. And that's because my lock is too, uh, too wide. I need something a little bit more granular. Exactly. Well, you know, now that you say that, I'm kind of thinking that uh, there is something, there is a concept I might be able to use, which is called a portfolio. So a portfolio is basically a collection of trades. And typically, traders care about only the portfolio that they participate to, and they don't necessarily care about that uh, total profit of all the others. So maybe I can use that to uh, reduce the granularity of, uh, of the lock, so increase the granularity of the lock. Uh, so what I would propose here is um, to introduce this portfolio object per portfolio and lock on that. So if you're trying to compile the code mentally, it won't compile here. Just imagine that you have a uh, mapping between the trade and the portfolio. So it is easy to find which portfolio this trade belongs to, grab the proper lock, and lock on that. Okay. Sounds good? Yes, uh, sounds uh, very good. At least now uh, we are gaining uh, some performance. We, at least we, on the executor service, we can have actually parallel execution rather than uh, just uh, tasks waiting on each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, also something I forgot to mention is the fact that since now I'm locking on a portfolio, I need to make sure that within that lock, I only modify, read, or write things that are related to that portfolio. So I've divided everything into portfolios. So and now my trade results are by, by, by portfolio, sorry, and my profit is by portfolio. <coughs> so this, this actually kind of helps me uh, to, to understand the code better because as a product manager, you know, since I have this schizophrenic double role, uh, I like to think about portfolios and it's, it helps me have those conversations with, uh, with developers. So I'm quite glad that we were able to get that concept into the code. Yeah, actually here, I think uh, this is uh, quite good because uh, uh, once again, as developers, uh, we our PMs, for example, uh, uh, you, you wouldn't uh, see our code, but uh, we don't know exactly how the PMs or maybe the, the guys who are actually using our solution think. So what we end up with uh, too much technical uh, uh, details in our code, which don't really map to, to the business logic. And actually the business, uh, if you go deep enough in uh, your, the business solution, you might uh, find ways uh, which can actually make your code uh, easier. So in this example, uh, rather than just blocking blindly on one global lock, we found uh, uh, a better solution. But this, uh, of course, this goes beyond uh, this uh, simple, uh, simple optimization. It goes, uh, you can have uh, several uh, solutions come up when uh, you know the business better. OK. OK. Um, so I guess it's it's good now. Well, uh, it's uh, good, but uh, I see we're still we're still using the synchronized uh, portfolio here. Uh, the synchronized and all the blocking uh, all the uh, locking uh, keywords that we have re-entered re locks, uh, read write lock, all of this uh, can be a bit uh, tricky. Uh, so. In real life, what happens is that uh, you have, in this example, we have just a several small, uh, like five lines of, uh, of code. But in real life, uh, what you have is uh, like classes with the thousands of lines of code. Uh, if you end up with uh, uh, several locks, uh, you need to know on which method, uh, on several methods, you need to lock on this uh, type of lock, not uh, the other one. And uh, <coughs> what happens is that th this is kind of uh, hidden knowledge in, uh, in the team. So it's not something that's easy to test. Uh, you can break it easily, and uh, you wouldn't know it uh, until uh, it happens uh, in production, because th these bugs tend to happen only in production. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, here, uh, also, for example, if uh, you have uh, newcomers in the team, uh, they, they, you need to check after them uh, more, because you need to check that they get this knowledge about where to lock and where to to, to keep uh, the whole code trade safe, which is uh, kind of uh, bad because uh, now your code becomes uh, even more hard to maintain, uh, which is uh, not good if you want to have a code uh, which uh, gives solutions rather than just uh, sp spending uh, half uh, your, uh, your brain cells on uh, just uh, where do I lock, where do I unlock. Hmm. So what you're saying here is that 
um, this synchronization, although it looks okay now, in the future, if we keep adding stuff and adding features and adding new developers to, to the team, it might make our life more difficult and slow us down exactly. and potentially even put our production into risk. Exactly. So I would definitely like to avoid that if we can, but I'm not, I'm not sure how. Well, uh, up to now, what we used is uh, uh, a lock-in, which is like a, a shared uh, memory model for communication between threads, uh, which is uh, okay, but uh, as soon as you reach a certain uh, limit uh, of uh, code size, it's, it's better to change uh, the, the model that you use. And here we could use the uh, message uh, passing model, uh, which is basically uh, instead of uh, uh, sharing uh, by uh, communicating between threads by sharing memory. You share memory by sending uh, messages. And here, for example, we could use the consumer producer pattern, which is uh, known a lot. And uh, what you would have is uh, basically uh, portfolios. Since we lock on uh, every portfolio, we can have like a calculator for uh, every portfolio. And uh, if each portfolio will have a queue that uh, it consumes to calculate uh, these uh, results. Okay, so what I understand from this is I will basically be replacing my synchronization on a portfolio by a queue and a single thread that's going to read that queue. That way it is guaranteed sort of built in the code and guaranteed by design that there will only be ever one thing happening on a portfolio at a time. Exactly. And that way uh, myself or other developers in the team will not have to worry about that. Yeah, actually now it's much easier to reason about your code because uh, before we, we were reasoning first about threads, then about uh, the, what uh, we do. Here we are, we are seeing a little bit uh, better the solution, so we are capable to reason more about the, the real business problems that we are trying to solve rather than uh, uh, being always worried about uh, locks. Okay, I think I can give that a shot. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide everything by portfolio, you know, since it's sort of becoming the, the pillar of, of our code. So I'm going to divide uh, into the trading service the um, sort of calculator logic, the trade calculation logic by portfolio. So when I receive a trade, I'm going to figure out which portfolio it, uh, it belongs to, pick the correct calculator, and send the compute trade request to it. And if we go into the trade uh, calculator by portfolio, I've added, I'm going to add a queue, as you said, for the requests. When I receive the compute trade method here, I'm simply going to add a request to the queue and then return the control right away. And I'm also going to add a consumer, which is a runnable, that is going to run until I tell it to stop. Now, how do I tell it to stop? I had to introduce a volatile Boolean in order to be able to control its life cycle and destroy it when I'm destroying my, my service. And then when I consume a uh, request from that queue, so I do a blocking request to, to, uh, to pull from the queue, when I consume something, I just execute my business logic. That way I know that there's only one thing happening at a time and there's absolutely no need to synchronize. Okay. Looks, uh, looks good? Yes. Um, okay, so I think I might have gotten a little bit carried away with my <laughs> aspiring dev role. And I forgot a very important part of my role, which is the product manager. And you know, I really like what you've been doing with the refactorings and all that, and it's, it's really good. But remember that total portfolio across all, uh, sorry, that total profit across all portfolios that we had? Well, we've lost that. With your refactoring by portfolio, we no longer have that global profit. And that global profit is actually something very important for our head traders. So those are uh, basically the managers that need to see a global vision of the profit of the entire trading floor. And we absolutely need to put this total profit back. So I don't know what you guys are going to have to do. Maybe uh, undo what you've done. I don't know. But we absolutely have to have that. It's too bad. I, I thought we practiced uh, this uh, <laughs> slides, but uh, I see we have forgotten requirements. Oh. OK. So. Here, I think uh, this, is, this is where we see the, the real benefit of uh, refactoring uh, continuously your code to a higher level, which uh, uh, maps better to, to the business uh, domain. Because uh, now, uh, you, you can uh, 
take advantage of the abstractions uh, that you came up with and just uh, uh, engineer solutions uh, based on that. So here actually our solution uh, would be quite easy. It's uh, just a, a new consumer of uh, profits uh, which are generated by each portfolio. And that would do the trick, it's easy. Okay, so I'm back to my junior developer role and I'm gonna try to do what uh, you told me. It sounds easy enough. I think if I got this correctly, what I'm gonna need to do is first of all, within the trade calculator, I'm going to have to add a step at the end in order to send the request to another, uh, to another queue. So I'm going to be sending the profit that I calculated for my portfolio and send it off to, to, to another queue. And I'm going to create this other total profit calculator that we, what, that we need. It's going to look a lot like the first one. It's going to have a request queue. When I receive a... Uh, a method on that uh, calculator, I'm going to add a request to the queue, same, same as before. And I'm also going to have a consumer, which is a runnable, again, the same logic, it's going to take from the queue and process that request. Okay. So it sounds like it's, it's doing what, it, what we would like it to do. Uh, yes, looks uh, okay. But uh, let me ask you, because uh, here we have queues a little bit uh, everywhere. Uh, so first, at first the bottleneck was actually the lock, so uh, we have uh, several requests, the, we have lock uh, contention and uh, we have uh, too many threads waiting. So I think here the bottleneck actually is the cube, because uh, what happens if uh, for some reason uh, you can't uh, consume uh, the requests uh, fast enough and the queue is uh, getting uh, too large? So let me ask you, uh, we, we didn't see in depth uh, what the compute profit does, uh, what does it do actually? Yeah, I can, I can explain that. So um, when I receive a, a compute profit uh, method, when I, I'm called on that method, what I do is I also have to call a remote service in order to retrieve some market data. So this is, you know, my Euro USD spots and stuff like that, which allow me to do financial calculations. Okay. So that is part of what I do, and then I iterate over all the trade results and do all those, you know, complex, fancy uh, computations. Okay, I see. Okay, so, so we need to solve this. And uh, one way to solve this is uh, basically a technique uh, which is called conflation. Basically what it means is just, uh, for example, uh, on the, the circle above is a consumer which is not using this technique. The, the one down on the, on the green is uh, using it. So if, for example, we have three requests waiting on the queue, uh, the first one uh, will just consume one at a time, uh, while the second one will, will actually consume whatever is in the queue. So, for example, what would happen here is that uh, the first one is still consuming the first uh, uh, message, but the second one is actually taking all, all of them at once. So, this actually is, uh, can be very, uh, can have several advantages because uh, Today, for example, uh, we, we deploy our services a lot on the cloud and uh, we pay for CPU and uh, network, uh, uh, all the network operations that we do. In this example, for example, we are calling a uh, uh, remote service. So it's, it would be nice to, to be able to batch those operations at once. And for example, you compute, you can find a way to, to merge maybe, you can find several ways, uh, actually it depends on uh, your problem, to batch the, those calculations to do them at once and uh, do one, for example, for calling, while calling the, the market data service, instead of calling it uh, three times uh, in the first uh, solution, you'd call it once for with the, all the data you need. I, I see what you mean. Yeah, that sounds like something I can, I can put in place. Uh, sounds like a good idea to me, but don't we still have the queue size problem? I mean, this, the queue can still get too large even if I conflate things, so now I'm getting a little bit worried what will happen. Yes, well, <coughs> well uh, in this case, uh, it first means that our service is very uh, successful. Uh, well, in that case, uh, we'd need to, to see other techniques. Uh, one is uh, called the back pressure, uh, which is uh, mostly known in reactive uh, uh, world. But here we can implement it by uh, making sure that our clients uh, is not sending too many requests. Uh, can be a little bit uh, hard to implement, but uh, it can be done. Uh, the, st the other solution uh, actually can be just uh, scale your application horizontally. So, for example, instead of having one instance, you can just have uh, two instances. That way, you, you are uh, 
reducing the 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 amount of uh, requests that are uh, that were uh, will go into one instance. Now you can split them on uh, several instances. Sounds good. Okay, I don't think this is the first problem that I'm going to have, but I'll definitely keep that in mind for when I uh, advance a little bit further in the implementation. So we're good to go, right? Well, <coughs> I'm not sure because uh, uh, if if you, if you look at the code, uh, does it uh, does it look uh, okay to you uh, up to now? Well, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't ask because I did notice a couple of things, but I was thinking maybe we can take a blind eye, you know and uh, turn a blind eye and just uh, go ahead. I did notice that there's quite a little bit of duplication with all this queuing logic, because every time I have another consumer producer, I have another queue, and then I have another volatile, and then I have the uh, runnable to consume, and uh, you know all the logic of stopping that consumer when I have to, taking from the queue and all that, so it kind of starts to get tedious at some point. I mean, it's fine for now, because I have only two things, but as you said, we hope this application is going to grow a lot. And I can kind of imagine this mushrooming into something uh, quite nasty. The other thing is that I find it very difficult in this code to actually find my business logic. Because as I said, there's so many queuing concerns and, and whatnot that uh, my business logic is sort of drowning within all that. But I'm, I'm not sure if we can do anything about that. Well, uh, actually you can because uh in, uh, for every solution, uh, one th uh, the you know this, this is software. Uh, we, we, we don't we don't write, uh, for example, uh, in uh, assembly we use uh, higher level abstractions. So whenever we have some uh, issue, we find a way to abstract all those uh, concerns which are not uh, really uh, part of your problem. So here, for example, uh, if you want to go further, actually, you can use the actor model. Uh, which is uh, nice actually f when dealing with the uh, highly concurrent uh, systems. So basically, what an actor is, it just uh, it's just a processing uh, unit, with uh, which consumes one message at a time. Uh, this way, it's uh, it's uh, trade safe in that regard because uh, uh, it doesn't. There's no way for it to consume uh, two messages uh, at a time. Uh, it can. It has uh, an internal state which uh, d it does not share with any other actor. And uh, you, the only way you can communicate with it is by sending messages. And uh, the act, what the actor does is either it sends messages or it can create uh, new actors. So actually, if, if, we ca if we are brave enough to go into this uh, new model, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can use uh, this model and uh, we'll end up with the code which is uh, already, uh, which is a lot even more easier to understand. And uh, for example, if uh, we, we look at a piece of code using uh, some actor model here, some implementation of actor model here. So actually here, uh, can you do, you, do you see, do you understand a bit uh, what the code does? Let me try. So it looks like I have something uh, called a portfolio calculator, which is an actor. It uh, overrides a process method, which gives it a request. And then within that method, I see only my business logic. So I don't see any queuing stuff going on. So I assume that what the actor system is doing behind the scenes is it's taking care of all the queues and the message passing. And it's just calling me. It's sort of like an SPI or service provider interface where I plug in my actor. I put only my business logic in there. And I don't have to worry about all the rest. Yes. OK, that, that's pretty easy to understand. And I also see here that I'm sending, at the end, I'm sending something to what looks like another portfolio the total portfolio actor. So the total portfolio actor is also an actor. It looks a lot like the previous one, so that's pretty easy to follow. It's very homogeneous. I also have a process method. It takes a request. And again, here I have only my business logic. So that's, that's pretty easy to understand. Good. <coughs> uh, well, up to now, you know, we, we've been uh, on the happy path because uh, we did not mention up to now what happens if you have uh, uh, errors, exceptionally when you work on a multi-threaded environment, it's uh, even more difficult to debug uh, your code. Uh, and uh, they, they, you, you can just uh, reproduce them because uh, every time the, the threads are, are, they are scheduled is different. 
So we need to make sure we have a way to, to always troubleshoot at least our application or have traces at least to be able to replay what has been happening. So uh, now, f for example, if uh, for one portfolio, for example, uh, there is an error, maybe the service is uh, the market data service uh, which we talked about is unreachable or uh, just there is an error calculation, maybe it's wrong input from uh, the client, for example. Mm -hmm. What uh, yeah, that can happen. Yeah. So uh, what do you suggest uh, we, we yeah. do actually? I mean, uh, uh, th thank you for mentioning that. I definitely want my traders to know when something went wrong with their request. Uh, so this is extremely important. Uh, I don't know, looking at this, I think maybe I can add an actor for errors. So I send it every time I, something wrong happens, I just send it the, the stack traces and it logs them. It sends them off to the uh, proper uh, users who are interested in them. Yeah, that could be a solution. Maybe. Yeah, this is uh, this is one way to implement it. Uh, but uh, if if you look uh, at uh, all the major implementations of the actor system, they come with uh, uh, a supervisor, uh, which uh, uh, which is uh, responsible of uh, just checking if all uh, actors are uh, doing okay. Uh, so in this example, for example, if the portfolio one actually really uh, uh, crashed. Uh, just throw an, an, an exception, the it, it, code exception, it just uh, is not working anymore. The, in the actor system, uh, implementation of actor systems, uh, you would have this uh, supervisor which is always uh, like pinging all actors and making sure they, they are uh, okay. And if one of them is uh, crashed, is not responsive, uh, we're, we're responding, uh, the, there can be some uh, resilience strategies where, for example, uh, he would restart the, this actor and uh, and uh, make it able to to consume messages again and uh, in this way actually what you end up with is uh, like a, of, of a kind of self healing uh, uh, system uh, where you can you are capable now to 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 uh, to uh, be resilient to all kind of errors and here what I, what I want to mention uh, underline here is that uh, the fact that we can uh, do this uh, it, it would have been much uh, more difficult to do this on uh, just the first piece of code that we, d we did if we kept it only with synchronizations and locks. And here actually we see the benefit of going uh, on a higher level of abstractions when you can, because that's when uh, actually your, 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 uh, what's the, that's where the v your value comes actually as engineers when you want to engineer solutions uh, that uh, uh, answer real business problems. And here, for example, uh, you, you can uh, do s s uh, this technique of uh, self-healing, where actually you can make uh, uh, your, your code, your system self-healing, which is uh, just uh, very, very difficult to do on, uh, if you kept just on uh, uh, locks, synchronization, etc. Great. So thank you very much for your help, Tofik, on this exercise. Okay. All right. So let's sum up what we've learned in this talk, summing up the deadly sins, as this is what the title promised you, right? Seven deadly sins. So the first deadly sin of concurrent programming is using alien threads, threads that you don't own, for non-trivial business logic, particularly blocking or locking on those, uh, those threads. And what can happen here is uh, you can just make your entire service unresponsive if you don't do that correctly. The second deadly sin of concurrent programming is not controlling the number of threads. You absolutely need to be in control of that. You cannot leave it up to chance or up to the number of requests that you receive or, or any of that at the risk of potentially reaching native memory limits or crashing, uh, crashing your service. The third deadly sin of concurrent programming is uh, locking unnecessarily on a large scope, which is a reflex that as developers we have because we think it's safer and we're better protected that way. However, what we're essentially doing here is not really doing anything in parallel anymore. The fourth deadly sin of concurrent programming is mixing business logic with threading or lower layer concern, which can make your life hell, basically. Uh, the fifth that listen of concurrent programming is locking on mutable shared state. So even if you manage to reduce the scope that you're locking on, the fact that you are locking on something and it's mutable gives you an illusion of parallelism. The sixth deadly sin of concurrent programming is settling for a low-level solution. When you can still go higher, go higher. Don't stop at a low-level solution. You will reap the benefits for, for that investment. 
The seventh deadly sin of concurrent programming is neglecting error handling and troubleshooting. You will spend lots of sleepless nights if you don't do this right. So these are the sins. What are the benefits that you can reap? What are the things that we have benefited from when putting these uh, best practices in place? First of all, better readability of your code. So that translates for you one year from now when you forgot what you did last year. And that translates also for others in your team and newcomers who are being onboarded much more quickly to the team. The second is easier maintainability and extension with new features. You'll be able to add new features more easily and causing less bugs and less regressions to, to show up. The third uh, benefit that we saw was a lower bug rate. So this is probably the most concrete one. It's really not subjective at all. We did the, the measurements, we did the, the math, and we had four times lower bug rate on code that followed these best practices versus code also in our team, also managed by the same people that did not follow the best, best practices for a similar rate of evolution and a similar um, rate of, of usage in production. So I think that's it, right? Thank you very much for, for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, we still have four minutes. Questions, please. Criticisms? So what kind of testing strategies would you apply for concurrent systems in particular? Yeah. So as we mentioned in this talk, unit testing alone is really not enough. I mean, uh, it's important, it's a first step, but you want to take it further. So you will definitely need integration tests that put your entire uh, service into, uh, into, you know, to the test. And uh, what we also do is uh, stress testing, and that's where we really uh, saw actually a lot of the things that we did not see neither in unit tests nor in any offline testing that you do. If you're not on the real environment, the real machine, you know, with the real number of cores and the real number of whatever, you're not really going to see all the, all the problems. So this is an important step also uh, in that process. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thanks. Thank you.